Have you ever found yourself being asked the question, what are the causes of chest pain? You're stumbling on your answer or your mind goes blank. Never again. There are in fact loads of different causes of chest pain and you need an easy way to be able to remember them for your exams, for real life and for when you're being grilled by your seniors. It's been shown that chest pain accounts for 20% of emergency department presentations. And although the majority of these are for benign causes, there are some emergency presentations that you must know how to spot. I'm going to help you master your exams on chest pain by teaching you the differentiating factors. It's the same approach which helped me to consistently rank top of the year at med school. But please don't watch this passively, be active in your learning. So pause this video right now and below I want you to try to recall as many of the seven emergency chest pain presentations as you can. Before we get into it, my name's Matt, I'm a doctor, and I'm here to help you study medicine smarter, not harder, and to recall more for longer. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and there's some free resources in the description. To unlock our fast way to recall these differentials, we need to understand the fundamentals. Why do we even experience chest pain? Our chest cavity contains a bunch of organs, each with their own nerve supply. We've got the heart, the great vessels, the lungs, the esophagus. Those are neatly contained from below from the diaphragm and from the outside by the ribs, the muscles, and the skin. But hang on, even problems with the stomach can cause chest pain. How does that work? You need to understand somatic versus visceral pain. Let's say you stub your toe. That injury may be transduced into a painful stimulus because of nociceptors. Action potentials will then form which will propagate up those nerve fibers to the areas of the brain that correspond to that location in your body. This is what we call somatic pain. And you can feel somatic pain in the chest where if you fracture a rib or sprain a muscle, then the somatic nerve fibers will be able to tell your brain exactly where on your chest that pain is. But the organs are different. In a heart attack, for example, you probably won't be able to say exactly where the pain is. You may feel it elsewhere, classically down the left arm, the jaw, or the side of the neck. This is called visceral pain, and it happens because your organs have different type of nerves called visceral afferents. These nerve fibers aren't like the ones in your toes. They hitch a ride with multiple different spinal root levels to be able to get to the brain. So when your brain's trying to decipher this information, it can't tell exactly where in your chest that this pain's come from. So you feel it broadly over a larger area. And this is why diseases of organs outside the chest, such as the stomach, can cause pain which is felt in the chest. Okay, so now we know somatic versus visceral pain, we can start building our system to never forget the causes of chest pain. Let's try an experiment to see where you're at. I'm gonna ask you a question and I want you to pause the video and answer it honestly. Tell me as many causes for chest pain as you can starting now. If you answered in a way where you said acute myocardial infarction, uh, muscle sprain, um, pulmonary embolism, you're using your system one way of thinking. Whereas if you use categories and you said there are X, Y, and Z causes of chest pain then went into them, that's your system two way of thinking. And that's exactly what we should be aiming for. System one is thinking fast. When you're put on the spot, it's what your mind goes to to grab the answers for the question put forward to you. And the reason it's at the top of your mind is because you've probably seen it before, maybe in real life, in your exams, or in your books. System two, on the other hand, is a slower, systematic way of thinking. And it's less prone to error than system one. This is what you fall back to for when you run out of ideas from just thinking fast. Interestingly, experts will spend most of their time in system one, but jump back and forth very quickly between one and two. They're able to marry up the patient they're seeing with this catalogue in their head of all the different types of chest pain and what they've seen before. But even if you don't have that vast clinical experience, there are ways in which you can remember more for longer by developing your system two way of thinking. The first step is to categorize, and I want you to think of chest pain anatomically. Specifically, the vast majority of cases will fall neatly into five categories. Cardiovascular, respiratory, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, and then a miscellaneous. Let's go into each one, one at a time. Cardiovascular causes affect the heart and the major blood vessels. Again, I think the easiest way is to think anatomically. You can think of the pericardium for pericarditis, the muscle layer to remind you of myocarditis, the valves to remember the angina of aortic stenosis, the bundle of hiss and the nerve fibers to remind you of that tachyarrhythmias can cause a painful sensation in the chest. And then the vessels, some of the most important ones here, such as acute coronary syndrome and aortic dissection. Now respiratory causes, again, think broadly anatomically. Think of the larger airways, such as chest tightness and asthma, down to the alveoli to remind you of pneumonias and pneumothorax, and don't forget the blood vessels to remind you of pulmonary embolism or the pain that you can feel in pulmonary hypertension. Gastrointestinal, think anatomically again, you've got the long tube of the esophagus and then the stomach. A lot of presentations for chest pain come into the gastrointestinal category. Musculoskeletal, think of the bones, the muscle and the skin. The bones could be rib fractures, 
the muscles can be muscular tears, and the skin can be due to varicella zoster virus. And lastly, there's a miscellaneous category. Mainly, it's gonna be psychiatric problems. This includes panic attacks and anxiety states. But we'll touch on that a bit later. Thinking in categories like this is gonna help you to remember more for longer. So when you're asked that question, you should be starting it by saying there are cardiovascular causes such as it's all well and good to know all of these differentials, but what's more important is being able to spot the emergency ones and being able to differentiate between each of these conditions. But first, let's continue to be active in our revision, pause the video right now and try to recall all those categories which I just mentioned. Let's talk about the emergency chest pain presentations. I ask you to comment below as many of the seven emergency presentations for chest pain as you can. It's not too late to do so if you want to do it right now. These conditions are the most life-threatening and they fall into the categories of cardiovascular, respiratory, and GI. Fortunately, there's an excellent way for you to remember this. The 4 two, one rule. There are four emergency presentations in the heart, two emergency presentations in the lungs, and one in the GI system. And just remember that you've got four heart chambers, two lungs, and one esophagus in the chest. The four cardiac emergencies are acute coronary syndrome, pericarditis, cardiac tamponade, and aortic dissection. The two lung emergencies are pulmonary embolism, and a tension pneumothorax. And the single GI emergency is esophageal rupture. Okay, so now you're able to remember more differentials for chest pain, and you're able to spot the emergency presentations. But now we're gonna talk about high yield differentiating factors from the past medical history, the examination findings, and the investigations which we then follow up with. The history here is everything. It gives you a lot of information to start being able to differentiate between the causes of chest pain. You've probably all heard of Socrates. This is a fantastic way to remember the different components of taking a pain history. It includes sight, onset, character, radiation, alleviating factors, timing, exacerbating factors, and severity. You're probably not gonna find that much in the examination side of things, but there's a whole wealth of information in the investigations. Blood tests such as full blood count, using these CRPs, and importantly, troponins. You'll probably need an ECG, and a chest X-ray can be helpful in differentiating the causes too. Of course, I'm just generalizing though, and it depends on the patient that you've got in your exam or in front of you. Let's see how those differentiating factors compare for the emergency causes of chest pain. Let's start with the four cardiovascular causes. Is this actually cardiac sounding chest pain? That's made up of three factors. Firstly, is it central and crushing, and perhaps it radiates down the left arm, the left side of the neck or the jaw. Second, is it made worse with exercise? And third, is it relieved by rest or GTN? If it ticks all three of those, then we call that typical angina. If it ticks two, we call that atypical angina. If only one, then we call that non-cardiac chest pain. Acute coronary syndrome is a family of three different conditions, unstable angina, end STEMI, and STEMI. And we differentiate that depending on ECG findings such as ST elevation or ischemic changes and the presence of raised troponins. Pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardium, the sac that surrounds the heart. The pain here tends to be pleuritic, which means that it's sharp and worse on breathing in and you may be able to quite vocally localize it to a point on the chest. Pericarditis is classically said to be worse on leaning back because it stretches the myocardium more than if you were bent forwards. ECG may show widespread saddle-shaped ST elevation. And on examination, you may hear a pericardial rub. You can differentiate that from a pleural rub by asking the patient to hold their breath at the same time. Next, dissection, another very worrying one. This is when the intima layer of the aorta tears. And there's two types, depending on if this tear is above the aortic valve or after the bend of the aorta. The exam findings may be normal, but a classic feature is if there's a difference in blood pressure between the left and the right arms. And the chest x-ray should show a widened mediastinum. A cardiac tamponade is when blood accumulates in the pericardium. You can spot this in exams by looking for Beck's triad, and you can remember that from the three Ds. Distended jugular veins, distant heart sounds, and decreased blood pressure. Moving on to pulmonary embolisms, a clot in the lung. This could be a huge clot, like a saddle embolus, which sits in the great pulmonary artery. Or they can affect the smaller branches, which supply areas of lung tissue. PE typically gives you a pleuritic chest pain. It's worse on breathing in. It's non-exertional and you expect to see risk factors for a PE like those listed here. Definitely think of this if you see any reference to a DVT and also an ECG may show this rare finding of an S1 Q3 T3. But they're more likely gonna be in sinus tachycardia. A pneumothorax is due to air accumulating in the pleural space. Simple pneumothorax is when air can move in and out, but a tension pneumothorax is even more dangerous and that happens when this is a one-way street. Each breath, more air accumulates in that pleural space and increases the pressure. And eventually this can collapse the lung and also compress the great vessels. Think of a spontaneous pneumothorax in those who are slim, tall, and marijuana smokers. 
but it can also happen in the context of ruptured bullae and COPD, as well as other presentation. The air of the chest will be hyper resonant to percussion with reduced air entry. The first thing you should be searching for is a large bore cannula, and you should insert that in the second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, and on top of the rib to avoid the neurovascular bundle in the inferior lip of the rib above. Moving on to the esophagus, an esophageal rupture is life threatening. A tear allows GI contents to enter the mediastinum, which can cause overwhelming inflammation. An esophageal rupture is called Borjavi syndrome, and it typically happens in the context of prolonged vomiting. It greatly increases the esophageal pressure. Just remember VTE, vomiting, thoracic chest pain, and subcutaneous emphysema. That's where you can feel air bubbles under the skin crackling under your fingers. So that's all the emergency ones out the way, but next is to think about the other non-emergency conditions which can still come into your exams. We think back to our five categories of chest pain, we've already pretty much covered all the cardiology ones. But with respiratory, that leaves pneumonia or infective exacerbations of COPD. Think of this in the context of fever, shortness of breath, and productive sputum. Onto the stomach, there's a few here. Remember, this is one of the most common causes of chest pain. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is where stomach acid backwashes up into the distal part of the esophagus. This pain tends to be worse after eating and worse when lying flat because that allows more acid to wash up through this incompetent lower esophageal sphincter. Peptic ulcer disease typically gives an epigastric pain but in some people you may feel it in your chest. The pain from duodenal ulcers tends to be worse when you're hungry whereas gastric ulcers tend to be worse when you're eating. And lastly, esophageal spasm when the lower part of the esophagus bunches up. This chest pain can be similar to unstable angina. It can happen at rest, but it isn't worsened by activity, but it can respond to GTN. You'll have dysphagia to both solids and liquids at the same time. If it's investigated further, a barium swallow will show a corkscrew esophagus. Onto musculoskeletal conditions, again, a very common cause of chest pain. A muscular tear, that can happen in the context if you're doing something strenuous. Think of those who are doing gardening, moving house, or doing otherwise torsional rotation activities. Costochondritis is inflammation or where the costal cartilage meets the bone. This is usually a diagnosis of exclusion, but if there is pinpoint tenderness over a specific part of the ribs, then you may want to think of costochondritis. Don't confuse this with Tietze syndrome, which is very similar. It involves costochondritis, but there's also a painful swelling in the skin as well. And lastly, precordial catch syndrome. This is a very common condition. We don't really know what causes it. It tends to happen in children and it's characterized by sharp pain, which can last up to about 30 minutes. It's due to intercostal muscle spasm, which can trigger the nerve endings. And the last category is psych. And this is one of exclusion. The ECG should be normal or sinus tachycardia. The troponins level should be normal. And there should be no other suspicious features on clinical examination. Do consider you may be seeing a presentation which is early in the evolution of an evolving disease. This label could be hard to get rid of. So we must make sure that for future presentations in someone with a history of anxiety or anxiety related chest pain, that it's still being worked up properly with all the investigations that we mentioned before. Ooh, we have covered a lot there. Let's remember that the way to never forget the causes of chest pain is to think about categories, cardiovascular, respiratory, GI, MSK, and psych. Check out the link in the description below for access to resources you probably didn't know existed. And if you want to support me to keep producing this content for you, please like, follow, and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next one.